Okay, with luck, this is now recording. Uh, today, uh, it's our, our regular Lisbon Mind and Reasoning Group uh, Work in Progress seminar. Um, and our speaker today um, is both a member of the group and is also Senior Research Fellow in, in, in Electronics and Computer Science at the University of Sussex, uh, University of Southampton, UK. Sorry for that. Uh, and uh, Paul is a sort of regular member of this group, so I won't do a lot more introduction. You can find his bio online, but perhaps the thing to say is that today he's going to give us a very ambitious sounding talk, which is technological trustworthiness, the free energy account. So take it away, Paul. Thanks, Rob. Um, I think ambitious is the... Uh, is, is a good way of characterizing this effort. Um, this is very much a work in progress. The goal is to, to try and understand something about uh, the application of trust-related concepts to technological systems. Um, and the reason why this has emerged to be an important topic of debate in recent years is because um, a lot of scholarly debates and, and also policy debates have uh, highlighted the importance of trustworthy systems, and the, these come in a variety of forms. So uh, there is a lot of debate about trustworthy artificial intelligence, trustworthy autonomous systems, and relative to the work that that I do for the Alan Turing Institute here in the UK, there is a lot of interest in what is called trustworthy digital identity systems. From a theoretical perspective, there are a couple of questions um, that, are, that are quite prominent. So the first is, the first relates to this idea of what it actually means to be trustworthy. Um, I mean, trustworthiness is a term that we're very familiar with in the context of interpersonal uh, situations and relationships but it's not entirely clear that we can apply this notion of trustworthiness to non-human technological systems. So there's a question there about what does trustworthiness actually mean? And then we have this associated question of whether trustworthiness is something that we can apply to non-human technological systems. Is it, is it appropriate to talk about um, technological systems as being trustworthy? Are they really the sorts of things that can be trustworthy? So as a means of making progress on this issue, I've been looking at the literature on trustworthiness. And these are some of the more prominent accounts of trustworthiness that have been discussed in the philosophical literature. And I'm not going to go through all of these in detail, but you can see that there are um, so, that, so there are at least five accounts that have been discussed in recent years. And these, I should say, are not the only ones. There's also a, a virtue theoretic account of trustworthiness, and there's also an obligation-based account of trustworthiness. But these um, five accounts that are listed here are the ones that I've been directing most attention to. Um, when it comes to the attempt to apply these to technological systems, we encounter a couple of issues. So the first is what I will call a unification problem. So we've got a number of different accounts of trustworthiness, but there isn't really any consensus on what it means to be trustworthy as such. And then the, perhaps the more important issue is that the vast majority of these accounts in the philosophical literature are oriented towards the realm of interpersonal relationships. So the trustee, the thing that is being trusted or the thing that is regarded as trustworthy, is almost always presented as a human individual. Um, and so that gives us what I will call the trustee problem. So the trustee problem is that existing theoretical accounts of trustworthiness are oriented towards human to human relationships. And so these two problems present a challenge for us in terms of developing a theoretical account of technological trustworthiness, trustworthiness as it applies to technological systems. Um, and just to say that 
at, at an abstract level, one thing that is common to these accounts and one thing that will become important later on is, is this idea that at a minimum, um, what one sees in all these accounts of trustworthiness is a degree of expectation. So it's commonly accepted that in order for some trustee to be trustworthy, they have to, to do what they are actually trusted to do. And the notion of trust is typically understood in relation to that. So a truster will trust a trustee um, in as much as they expect the trustee to do what they are trusted to do. But philosophical accounts typically invoke additional criteria over and above this expectation. So the difference between um, many of the theoretical accounts of trustworthiness is not so much the fact that they are departing from this view of expectations. They, they all accept that the truster has expectations about the trustee, but it's but one of the things that distinguishes different accounts of trustworthiness from one another is really the reasons that relate to that expectation. So different accounts of trustworthiness highlight, um, they place different emphasis on the extent to which the trustee is motivated by issues such as goodwill, moral integrity, reputational concerns, the value assigned to social relationships, and so on. In addition to the, the two problems that I've already discussed, the trustee problem and the unification problem, we also have something that I will uh, gloss as the relativity problem. And the relativ relativity problem is essentially this. So when, when, we talk of, when we talk of trustworthy technological systems, trustworthy AI or trustworthy autonomous systems, there is often an implicit assumption that that those terms denote a system that can be uniformly regarded as trustworthy. So from an engineering perspective, what we're trying to develop is a trustworthy system where trustworthiness is a property of that system. It's something that can be measured um, or assessed at least. But that suggests that trustworthiness is something that can be considered regardless of a set of circumstances or a set of relationships, that it's something of an absolute kind of concept. But there are reasons why that kind of absolutist conception of trustworthiness seems to be inappropriate. Um, if you look at trustworthiness in detail, you think about um, trustworthiness, it seems to be more of a relativistic notion than it is an absolute one. And I'll just illustrate that with a couple of examples. So firstly, um, we can have a situation where there are multiple trusters, um, but if those trusters have competing interests, then it doesn't seem appropriate to say that a single trustee can be uniformly trustworthy to all of those trusters. So if Rob, trusts me and I am genuinely trustworthy relative to Rob, that doesn't mean that I will be trustworthy to everyone else. In fact, if there, if Rob has a, a worst enemy, I'm not sure he does, he's a very friendly guy, but if Rob has an enemy, then it seems that I cannot also be trustworthy to that enemy. I must pick a side. I can't be equally trustworthy to both. One cannot be the trustworthy servant of masters who have multiple competing who, who of multiple masters who have competing interests and this is particularly um, uh, salient in a technological context so if we imagine uh, if we think about the attempt to develop trustworthy autonomous systems such as trustworthy military drones it doesn't seem appropriate to regard those systems as being trustworthy in a simpliciter or an absolute sense, because those drones are being put into situations where there are multiple potential trusters with competing interests. So an autonomous drone might be very friendly to, uh, uh, to, to, to one set of military forces, but by its very nature and the situation in which it's deployed, it cannot be trustworthy to an opposing side. So it's not appropriate to talk of it, to talk of the drone as being trustworthy in an absolute sense, rather 
it's trustworthy in a relativistic kind of sense. And this is not, not a new problem. Um, so as long ago as 19, uh, 1658, Samuel Crook wrote that, um, but he that is a friend to all men is a friend to no man and least of all to himself, for he must promise so much that he cannot perform with all. And so break and promise with some, he is trusted at length by no one. So the general idea there is that one cannot be a friend to everyone. <laughs> one must be reasonably selective and, and, and trustworthiness is, is, is seen in the same sort of way. There is another aspect of this relativity problem which pertains to um, domains of interactions or, or, or the contexts in which you're actually trusting someone to do something. So within the trust literature, one sometimes comes across this idea of a three-place account of trustworthiness or a three-place account of trust where some truster trusts a trustee to, to do something. And, and here we have another form of relativity. So, so we might say that Sarah trusts Paul to pick up Chloe from school. And Sarah's trust could very well be well-placed in the sense that Paul is trustworthy relative to that particular action. Okay, but there could be other domains of interaction in which Paul is not quite so trustworthy. So if Sarah trusts Paul to share the last cookie, well, there's no chance that's happening, right? I'm not very trustworthy when it comes to cookies. So to say that Paul is trustworthy relative to Sarah doesn't seem to be quite right. Paul is trustworthy relative to Sarah with respect to some things, but he is not necessarily trustworthy with regard to all things. And as one example from the literature, uh, this is taken from a paper by Robbins in 2000, 2016. Um, Robbins alludes to this uh, relativistic issue when he writes that um, he trusts his wife, but he doesn't trust his wife for, for absolutely everything. So he might trust her to edit a paper or maintain fidelity, but he doesn't necessarily trust her with medical advice or to trust, he doesn't trust her to fly a plane. So he writes that under these conditions, I might assume that her motivations towards my interests are the same, regardless of the matter at hand, but her ability to actualize each of these matters will vary. As a result, my beliefs about her trustworthiness will vary from matter to matter. So relative to a consideration of theories of trustworthiness and, and, and the philosophical literature in this area in general, we can see that we've got a number of problems. So one of these problems relates to the fact that we've got multiple accounts of trustworthiness, and it isn't clear which one, if any one, is applicable to technological systems. We've got this second problem that, that I've glossed as the trustee problem, which is this idea that pretty much all accounts of trustworthiness in the philosophical literature are directed to the realm of interpersonal relationships. And it, it's difficult to see how they could apply to, to technological entities, especially when we, we're talking about the motives or the reasons for acting in a particular way. And then we've got this relativity problem. Um, and the problem here is that when we are developing technological systems or even talking about technological systems, it's common to, to refer to technological systems or trustworthy technological systems in an absolute or simplicitous sense. But our understanding of what trustworthiness is seems to suggest that an absolutist conception is untenable and that we ought instead to countenance a more relativistic conception of trustworthiness. So what I'm going to do in the remainder of the talk is I'm going to attempt to link our understanding of trustworthiness to, um, to issues of free energy, as these issues have been discussed in the context of the theoretical neuroscience literature, particularly the literature on predictive processing. And I'm going to suggest that this free energy approach provides us with a potential way of addressing all of these problems while simultaneously giving us a new account of trustworthiness, a new way of thinking about what trustworthiness is. 
So I'll start with a with a brief overview of um, the predictive process in account and the notion of free energy. So some of you may already be familiar with this, of course, um, in philosophy of cognitive science and theoretical neuroscience. There has this, been this emerging framework uh, that regards the brain, the human biological brain, as in essence a predictive a hierarchically organized predictive machine, a system that is um, that is engaged in the attempt to predict its own activity at multiple spatial and temporal scales. So according to a, the most popular um, uh, uh, conception, different regions of the cortex are organized in the form of a hierarchy, um, and higher regions of the cortex generate predictions about the activity of lower cortical regions. And so from higher regions to lower regions, we have a cascade of predictions. And then from bottom layers towards more higher layers, we have the communication of prediction error. And the idea is that this prediction error plays a role in, 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 both, the, in both modifying the activity of higher cortical regions, um, but also as playing a role in uh, learning related processes. So as a, as a way of kind of summarizing this sort of idea, the, um, one of the core tenets of the, this kind of free energy or predictive process and approach to the brain is that the computational imperative of the brain is to minimize an information theoretic isomorph of statistical free energy which translates to long-term prediction error. So the brain is constantly trying to minimize the amount of prediction error over a variety of temporal and spatial scales. So, um, so one issue that, that, that arises here is, well, where do these predictions come from? Um, the, the core idea is that predictions are being generated from the top down and, and um, uh, and, uh, and that the accuracy of these predictions plays a key role in the amount of prediction error that results. The idea, according to this theoretical framework, is that these predictions emanate from a generative model. And a generative model, as it is characterized by Clark in 2016, um, is as follows. So he suggests that a generative model aims to capture the statistical structure of some set of observed inputs by inferring a causal matrix able to give rise to that very structure. So the idea here is that the brain is attempting to acquire a generative model, which enables it to generate these predictions. And that generative model is attempting to embody the causal structure of the world. And that makes a lot of sense because one way to predict the world is to under some, understand something about the causal structure of the world. If you can understand what causes are, are at play in the world, then that gives you a potentially good predictive toehold over what's going to, to happen. So I want to, to pick up on two aspects of this free energy um, approach to the brain that will be important in the context of our consideration of trustworthiness. Um, so the first is to look at, at uh, this, this paradigm with regard to perception. So the nice thing about the predictive processing framework is that it provides us with a unified understanding of both perception and action. In essence, we've got the same sort of computational architecture in play and we just tweak some of the parameters of that architecture to give us insight into the nature of perception and the nature of action. So when it comes to perception, the idea is that um, the brain ele elevates the precision of prediction errors. That's the upward stream from bottom up to higher up, the bottom, so the bottom to higher up stream of information. Um, by elevating the precision of those prediction errors, the idea is that the activity of higher cortical regions is brought into alignment with sensory input. So in effect, in perception, we change our predictions to match the world. And this is what um, I, I will call 
passive inference. I'm not sure whether this term is, is widely used in the philosophical literature, but it's a nice way of distinguishing uh, the form of inference that's in play in perception from that which we see in the case of action. So let's have a look at action. So in the case of action, the idea is that the opposite occurs. So in contrast to elevating the precision of prediction errors, the idea is that the precision of prediction errors is reduced. And this culminates in, uh, uh, this translates into, um, uh, th this yields the following, that the activity of lower cortical regions is brought into alignment with higher cortical regions. And this cascades all, all the way down the, the hierarchy to the skeletomuscular system and the generation of motor output. So in contrast to perception, what we see here is, is the opposite. Rather than changing our predictions to match the world, in the case of action, we are changing the world via actions to match our predictions. And this is what is widely known as active inference. So thus far, I've talked about predictive processing and free energy. I'm going to make a distinction here. So I'm going to call this particular form of free energy, neural free energy. And as I said, it's, it's rooted in recent research in cognitive neuroscience. Um, we can think of it in terms of prediction error. And we've seen that there are a number of ways by which the brain can minimize free energy. So first of all, we can adjust our predictions to match the world. This is what I call passive inference. We can also adjust the world to match our predictions, which is what I called active inference. And then we have this third form, which is based around the idea that we can, via learning, um, come to acquire a generative model that enables us to make better predictions. And if one is able to make better predictions, then one um, uh, is, is, is less subject to prediction error. The more accurate one's predictions the less error that results from those predictions. I want to contrast that with what I will call social free energy. And the free energy account of trustworthiness is, is very much based around this, this, this concept. So whereas the biological brain is concerned with the minimization of its own free energy, what I want to suggest here is that trustworthy entities, which could be humans or technological systems, are concerned with the minimization of the free energy of others. So they are concerned with the minimization of expectation or prediction related errors in a social context. So trustworthy entities, um, we might say, are concerned with the minimization of what might be called social free energy. So some of those entities will also be concerned with neural free energy. That's the likes of you and me. But what it means to be a trustworthy entity, I suggest, is to be an entity that's concerned with the free energy of others, other agents, which I'm calling social free energy. And what this gives us is a way of thinking about the actions that a trustworthy entity might engage in in order to minimize the free energy of another agent and in essence i suggest that that trustworthiness is is based around meeting the expectations of a truster or at least coordinating their behavior in a way that serves to minimize the expectation or prediction related errors um, that arise from situations in which a trustor places their trust in a trustee. And <clears throat> that, that will become a bit clearer <laughs> as, as we go on. But, uh, um, but firstly, just to say that at this point, we're returning back to this um, idea that trustworthiness is intimately linked to expectations. So as I said, most philosophical accounts of trustworthiness see trustworthiness has been more than expectations, but that isn't to say that expectations don't lie at the core of theoretical accounts of trustworthiness. And that core gives us a very good starting place for a free energy account of trustworthiness. So 
at a minimum, it seems that trustworthiness is tied to this idea that a trustee is meeting the expectations of a truster. If X, the trustor, places their trust in Y, the trustee, then the trustor expects or predicts that Y, the trustee, will do as they are trusted to do. If they didn't have that expectation, then they wouldn't place their trust in the trustee. So if Rob trusts me to write a paper, then he expects me to write a paper at a minimum. If he didn't have that expectation, he wouldn't trust me to do it. So that kind of link with the core of trustworthiness in terms of expectations gives us the starting point for a number of mappings between neural free energy and social free energy that will then serve as the basis for addressing the three problems that I discussed at the beginning of the presentation. So the first mapping relates to passive inference. So passive inference, recall, occurs in a perceptual context, and it's this idea that we change our neural predictions so as to match the dynamics of the incoming sensory stream. From a social free energy perspective, we can think about this in the following sort of way. So if X, the trustor, trusts the trustee in situations where the trustee cannot fulfill the trust that is placed in them, then the trustee will act so as to change X's expectations. They will, for example, say that they cannot do what they are expected to do. So if Rob trusts me to write a paper and I can't write that paper at the present time because I'm too busy, then rather than just letting him place his trust in me and then being disappointed or feeling betrayed at a later stage, I will actually intervene and say, no, you can't place your trust in me at this particular point because I'm too busy. So he might be disappointed by that, but I've nevertheless prevented from, uh, I've, I've prevented him from placing his trust in me and then uh, uh, later on down the line, uh, incur in a situation where my trustworthiness might be called into question. But in what I'm doing here, if in as much as I intervene, is I'm changing his expectations in the same way that we see predictions being changed in a perceptual context. In a social free energy context, the trustee is acting in such a way as to modify the expectations or the predictions of the trustor. Another mapping comes in the form of active inference. So if you recall in active inference, we change the world via our actions so as to match neural predictions. In a social free energy context, I suggest that um, this translates as follows. If the trustor trusts the trustee in situations where the trustee can fulfill the trust that is placed in them, then the trustee will act so as to fulfill the trustor's expectations. So in effect, the trustee becomes an extension of tr the trustor's agency. So if Rob trusts me to write a paper and I can write that paper, there's no reason why I can't, then I will change my actions in such a way as to make, as to fulfill Rob's expectations of me. So I will um, meet Rob's expectations by changing my action in such a way as to fulfill those expectations. So this is the social free energy equivalent of active inference where we're changing the world in such a way as to make our predictions come true. And then finally, we have this mapping that centers on the notion of learning. So um, as I said, one way of reducing prediction error is to learn about the world so as to make better predictions and in a social free energy context, it should be clear that the trustee can provide learning opportunities for the trustor. So um, I, as a trustee, can um, provide learning opportunities for those who might place their trust in me. So by being open and honest and transparent, about the sort of entity that I am, about the kinds of abilities that I have and the kinds of motives that I have, I enable 
other potential trusters to learn about me and to learn about the kinds of situations in which their trust in me might be well placed. And you might think of that in terms of um, in terms of me providing opportunities for them to tweak their generative model about the sort of entity that I am, about the kind of kinds of things that makes me tick. And so that enables them to form more accurate expectations about the sorts of situations that they can rely on me, the kinds of things that they can expect me to do in particular situations. And so if they have a particularly, if they have an accurate expectation or understanding of me, then they won't attempt to place their trust in me in situations where they know that that trust can't be fulfilled. Um, so there won't be any need for me to, to intervene so as to change their expectations because their expectations have already <clears throat> been changed via, via a learning process. Hey, Paul, I think you might have sort of maximum 10 minutes. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. So, so now we've seen some of these mappings, we can begin to, to think about the kinds of problems that I talked about earlier. And I suggest that when it comes to, to trustworthiness, there are two basic ways in which trustees can act so as to minimize social free energy. So the first is that the trustee can play an active role in shaping the trustee's expectations, and they can do this by providing learning opportunities, by being open, open and honest and transparent about the sort of entity they are. They can also intervene in situations where trust is placed to effectively prevent the truster from placing trust in them. And secondly, the truster can just behave in a manner that fulfills the truster's expectations. So when trust is placed, the trustee responds to the placement of trust by doing what the truster expects them to do. Interestingly, these various ways of minimizing social free energy establish a point of contact with the theoretical accounts of trustworthiness that I talked about earlier. So being honest and uh, being open and honest about the sort of entity that one is um, establishes a nice point of contact with what is called the Confucian account in the trust uh, literature. The idea that we're preventing the truster from placing trust in situations where trust cannot be fulfilled is something that uh, is a feature of what is called the commitment account. And then this idea of the trustee responding to the placement of trust by doing what the truster expects them to do. This is a feature that we see in um, the counting on account, the trust responsiveness account, and the encapsulated interest account. So what I want to suggest here is that we we already have the basis, we already have a means of seeing how the free energy account might speak to two of the problems that I talked before. So the first was the unification problem. There's no consensus on what it means to be trustworthy. From a free energy perspective, I think we are provided with an opportunity for theoretical integration. So we have an account that enables us to see how the different aspects of all these existing accounts might be brought together within an overarching unitary theoretical framework. And then as regards the trustee problem, this idea that theoretical accounts are oriented towards human to human relationships. One of the nice things about the free energy account is that it's not necessarily geared towards the realm of human to human uh, interactions or, or human interpersonal relationships. So nothing that I've said about the free energy account and the minimization of social free energy um, is, is anthropocentric in that sort of sense. It's not just something that humans can do. There's no reason why technological systems might not be able to act as free energy minimizing devices and minimize the social, minimize the free energy of their human interactants. So we have a potential means of resolving the trustee problem as well. Um, in terms of the relativity problem, I want to suggest, I, I, I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I'm running out of time, but essentially I want to say that the free energy account gives us a means of tackling this problem as well. In particular, it enables us to regard a trustworthy entity as trustworthy in something of an absolute sense 
And what's key here is the idea that a trustworthy entity should act in a way that avoids the possibility of betrayal. So in short, my claim is that if a trustee always, one, fulfills the trust that is placed in them, two, they take steps to avoid misplaced trust, and three, they prevent the placement of trust when such trust cannot be fulfilled, then the trustee is trustworthy in an absolute sense. So in as much as one accepts that claim, then I think we can resolve the relativity problem uh, in favour of this absolutist conception of trustworthiness. We can regard a, a trustworthy system, technological system, as being trustworthy in an absolute or simpliciter sense. Um, and just as a means of reinforcing that, so if we go back to our the case of our drone, um, so we, we can accept the idea that why the trustee, the drone, cannot fulfill the trust that is placed in them by both X1 and X2, where X1 and X2 are competing sides in an armed conflict. But the trustee, the drone, can, however, take steps to prevent X2 from placing their trust in them. So if the if X2 requests the drone to do something for them, then the drone can just say, no, I can't do that. You can't trust me in this context. If they do that, then I suggest that does not make the drone less trustworthy. It doesn't make the drone less trustworthy simply because the drone has not betrayed um, the truster. Um, what the drone has done in effect is to prevent the placement of trust. And if one prevents someone from placing trust in them, then one cannot betray the truster. So there is a, there is a correspondence here between promissory obligations um, one cannot break a promise that one has not made, right? So if, if Rob wants me to promise him something and I say no, then that does not make me a bad promisor because I haven't made a promise to him. So therefore, I, he can't accuse me of breaking a promise later on. And then if we think about Robin's wife and, and, and the, the, the extent to which Robin's wife is untrustworthy relative to flying a plane, so I think the, the, the problem here is that Robbins is thinking about a situation in which his wife is going to fly a plane and then he's wondering about his safety and he's thinking, well, my wife can't be trustworthy in this situation because she can't fly a plane. But in a more realistic context, we can imagine that Robbins might very well ask his wife to fly a plane and his wife would just say no because she would not be the sort of entity that would want to put her husband's life in jeopardy. So one hopes that if Robbins asked his wife to fly a plane, she would refuse. And it's this refusal, which is this kind of, um, this, this, this counterpart to passive inference, changing the trust door's expectations. It's that that I suggest exemplifies her trustworthiness, not her failure to fulfill the trust that is placed in her. So some of the virtues of the free energy account. So firstly, it provides us with a, a link a, and a novel link between predictive processing or free energy accounts of cognition and the notion of trustworthiness. It provides us, I think, with a unified way of understanding what it might mean to be trustworthy, which is what I've dubbed the unification problem. It provides us with a non-anthropocentric conception of trustworthiness. It therefore enables the notion of trustworthiness to be applied to both humans and technological systems. This is what I call the trustee problem. And it opens the door potentially to a one place or absolutist conception of trustworthiness, which provides us with a potential way of tackling the relativity problem. There are, however, some problems here. And the first is that the free energy account requires a degree of cognitive sophistication on the behalf of the trustee. So among other things, the trustee needs to be able to assess their own abilities. They need to be able to detect when trust is being placed in them. Um, and they need to be able to act in such a way as to either respond in a way that, that fulfills the trustee's expectations or to intervene and modify um, the truster's expectations. So that requires a degree of sophistication, which I suspect many of our contemporary technologies and perhaps all of our contemporary technologies just lack at the present time. It also requires a degree of 
communicative competence. So an ability to, um, in some situations at least, explain why one isn't, isn't going to cooperate with what the truster wants the technology to do. Um, and then finally, we have an issue about autonomy. So technological systems are developed primarily to serve the interests of their corporate masters. Okay. And that means that there are constraints as to what kinds of things we can expect a technology can do. And it may very well be the case that trustworthiness and autonomy go hand in hand. So one can only really be trustworthy in an absolute sense if one is not beholden to the interests of a master. It's very difficult, I think, to be trustworthy to everyone if one is a, a slave. So in summary, um, I pre pre presented this working account of technological trustworthiness, which is intended to tackle um, three problems relating to um, a, a theoretically unified account of trustworthiness, um, the extent to which uh, trustworthiness applies to more than human individuals, uh, and this idea that from a technological perspective, at least, idea, we would ideally like to have an absolutist conception of trustworthiness, a way of thinking about technological systems such as AI systems as being trustworthy in an absolute sense to all actual and potential trusters. The solution to these problems I suggested comes in the form of the free energy account, which takes its inspiration from recent work in theoretical neuroscience and also to an extent work in deep machine learning. And this account, I think, gives us a new, it, it yields a number of theoretical and practical payoffs. So it's not necessarily, as I said, this is a working account. I'm sure there are plenty of problems to be ironed out and considered. But at the very least, I think it gives us a new way of thinking about trustworthiness and an opportunity to resolve a number of long-standing theoretical problems. And it also, I think, has implications for the way in which we create, control, deploy, and uh, and manage technological systems. So that's it. I'll finish there. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Paul. Very nice. Um, you know, lots of uh, very interesting ideas there and uh, deep account. I mean, look, just one thing. Maybe unless Alberto wants me to stop recording, I could just keep recording because there's only very few of us here, right? And sure. uh, it might be it might be it might be useful to pull. Um I have a few sort of they might not be very deep questions, but they're more like sort of um points, caveats, different little things. I don't know if do you have anything, Alberto? Do you want to um no, I am happy. So I, I don't have any question. I, I I found the lecture interesting, but I don't know too much about the topic, so I just Okay. Okay. So look. So thank you. Thank you, Paul, for the talk. I mean, uh, yeah. Welcome. I, I don't have no questions. So. Sorry. Okay. Well, I mean, maybe you'll find something later. So let me just. So let me just go on. So look, some of these are very, are very minor points, right? And they might be almost off topic, but I'm going to put them anyway, so you can. I'll just put them in a list, and then if you want, to, I've got the list here, so I can go back over. So the first one is just. Um, this is in the sort of caveat thing. I think there's a. When you began. The, ver the premise of the talk about human to human relationships, and this is how we've kind of couched trust in the past, right? I mean, accounts of trust or thoughts about trust or indeed trust about human. I think that's up to a point that's true, but I don't think it's totally true, or at least let's, so my caveat is this. Sometimes we trust organizations, right? In a way that are not straightforwardly human to human. So I'm gonna have an example, which is you trust a bank. Right. You you trust a bank to do certain things such as hold your money and be available to give you your money when you come out. And that's not really a, that's not really it's a different kind of relationship to, for, to, to, to trusting an individual, arguably, because although the bank has a, you know, so it might be a legal person in some sense. It's not. A, it's not a person, and indeed, of course, they are probably what you would call a social machine now as well. I mean, they're complex, uh, semi-technical entities, right? I mean, cool. highly technical. So there's that. So that might be one of the most important. But then the second one is just look. It's this is 
this is one which is probably off topic, right? But I'm going to ask you anyway, because I'm just kind of interested. And uh, this is the one about free energy. So when when one says, such as Andy Clark and probably many others, that um, the free energy account is trying to minimize, um, you know, surprisal or whatever about the causal structure of the world. I mean, is it really the causal structure of the world, which, or is it something, could, could we also account for it in terms of covariance? You know, so there's there's a funny thing here, right? Because causes are, I mean, I thought about this, but given I've got you here, I might as well ask you. I mean, you know, causes are infamously a difficult issue in philosophy, right? I mean, Hume doubting that we ever see any causes at all. So, you know, according to a sort of Humean account, you know, discovering the causal structure of the world would be something like magic, right? Because we can't uh, ever get to the causes. So I just, you know, I put that to you, but I realise that somewhat goes beyond the scope of your talk and it might be, you know, something that you don't want to answer. Um, now, you kind of anticipated my third question right at the end, right? Which was, do trustworthy systems need to have any concerns at all? So I trust my dishwasher, right? I trust my dishwasher to... Uh, wash my dishes, providing I don't put a pan in it, which is full of fat, which is really kind of greasy and sticks to the side. And so I trust it to do it because it has met, according to your account, it's met my expectations in the past and experience tells me uh, that it will do this. And I know very well if I put a sticky pan into it, it's not going to be very effective because that's just, just that. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to have any kind of adaptive abilities at all. It just does what it does. Right. So it's a kind of, uh, there is a kind of trust of artif uh, there is a kind of trust that might be applied to artifacts that it doesn't really require any complex adaptation. Right. This is a kind of slightly extra point then. This goes back, sorry, I jumped out of sequence here. Um, I mean, I can stop after this one if you want, because it might be like I realize I might be laying on too many things, but so this one is this one goes, I mean, in a sense, it might cut to the heart of things, right? But I'm not I'm not really sure. But so it goes back to the trustworthiness of multiple masters. Now, I suspect, and this is not really to say that your account might not work in its unificatory way, but I have a suspicion that I trust different entities or organizations in just quite different ways. So, for instance, if I have a lawyer, which I, I don't have, but if I had one, I would trust I would trust a lawyer to represent my interests, right? So that would be a very kind of personal trust in relationship to me. And if I found the lawyer was working for somebody else, you know, against my interests, you know, I would be that that would be a severe breach of trust. Whereas, for instance, a bank, I just trust a bank to do something, right? I trust the bank to hold on to my money, not misrepresent its accounts to me. And I'm pretty even even my worst enemy could have the same banking facility, same banker as me. But in general, that wouldn't be a problem. I wouldn't want to withdraw my account because I just trust them to do things, you know. So on the face of it, it might be the you know trusting of others qua um, them doing something for me to represent me might be quite different from trusting the bank to fulfill its role. And the bank, I don't know, it could be close to the dishwasher example, right? I just trust it to do certain things and not others. So there is, so I put this like this, there could be a danger that you're pushing your unification beyond what we really need in a certain kind of way. I mean, it's a weird kind of, you know, it's doing too much almost, right? Um, but okay, maybe not. So, um, right. Okay. Well, I got one more then. One more. All right, all right, all right. Go on, go on. Might as well do it as I'm doing the whole <laughs> lot. I got two more actually, but the other one I can. But so the last one is this, right? I somebody might be totally untrustworthy. I just know that every time I give them money, they're going to get drunk, right? Or they just tell me they're going to do something. And in a certain sense, my expectations and predictions are very good about that person, right? They always break trust. But that does that mean I trust them in a certain kind of way? I mean, according to your account, it might do because they're very predictable. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, so with regard to the first point, which was about um, trust in not so much non-human entities but collections of yeah. human entities. Yeah. So, so this within the trust literature. There has been plenty of debate about what is sometimes called organizational trust or institutional trust, trust in institutions. And the, the philosophical community is somewhat divided on the extent to which 
we can genuinely trust institutions, organizations, or whether those institutions, organizations are worthy of trust or, or, or as being trustworthy. Um, I think what, uh, what I would say here is when it comes to the attempt to, to develop a philosophical account of trustworthiness, the attention tends to be mostly directed towards human individuals. And some philosophers see human, only human individuals as being the appropriate target of trust, appropriate object of trust. Um, that isn't uniformly the case. And there are some accounts of trustworthiness that, that might allow for institutional trustworthiness in the sense that an organization, although it's not an individual human agent, it still possesses some degree of agency. So it, it, it's capable of recognizing when, a, when trust is placed in it and of adapting its behavior accordingly. And it's capable of communicating information to trustors that could be deemed honest, open, transparent, or otherwise. Um, so opinions are somewhat mixed in, in, in this area. Um, I think not, not all of the accounts of trustworthiness, including those that I presented, are necessarily confined to the realm of human individuals. The human, in, human individuals are like the archetypal focus point, but, but, but some theorists do consider institutional organizational trust. Um, but that is really because institution, the, 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 the issue is more about one of agency and responsiveness. Um, in contrast to that, many philosophers I would say the majority of philosophers don't accept the idea that trustworthiness is something that is applicable to, to technologies simply because they, they see technologies as operating in a, in a kind of mechanical sense as not being, they're going to do what they do regardless of how you act towards them, right? Um, there's no kind of sensitivity to the fact that you're depending on them as such, and they certainly don't coordinate their actions in a way uh, that takes account of that dependency. It's more that they are they are mechanical contrivances that that that, that do what they do. Um, I mean just just to, just if you don't mind, just I mean if you look at anything like almost everywhere you characterize it is what's new, I mean this is kind of obvious to you, but what's new about our new technological circumstances like i'm reading this on life manifesto with luciana ferini and many others anybody who looks at that i mean what people always say is that systems are more responsive more autonomous now that's just the kind of systems that we have i mean that's also what i write about in e-memory and these things right so i think everybody agrees that they are that's the situation of our new technological devices maybe not my dishwasher but in yeah. general every yeah. you know systems we're living with will be those kind of systems yes i mean i think that's um you know that's something certainly something to bear in mind and i think that's one of the reasons why trustworthiness is why, why there has been this burgeoning interest in trustworthiness that the technologies are becoming more sophisticated um i mean relative to the free energy account as i discussed at the end of the presentation um the free energy account does require some degree of cognitive sophistication, communicative competence, some degree of agency and autonomy. Um, so it's not necessarily it's not necessarily divesting itself of all the constraints that those other theoretical accounts have imposed. But it is kind of it's kind of trying to move away from this idea that that trustworthiness is a specifically human type phenomenon. Um, so yeah, I think that's what that's what I'd say in res in regard to the first point. Um, the issue about causal structure. Hmm. <laughs> you can avoid that one if you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so my understanding of the literature in this area is that um, the the acquisition of a generative model is mostly 
guided by the imperative to reduce prediction error. And one way of reducing prediction error is to form more accurate predictions. The reference to causality, I think, just comes from um, the way in which those causal relationships are reflected in the sensory stream. Um, so if I close my eyes, the world goes dark. Um, and so the thing that is causing the world to go dark is not something to do with the world. It's something to do with my own actions. If I change my head, the nature of the sensory input changes. And the idea behind a generative model, I think, is that the brain is learning about these kinds of contingencies that if one changes their head in certain ways or one engages in certain actions, that that yields sensory consequences. And one can use those contingencies to productive effect in terms of meeting certain kinds of goals. Um, so as far as I'm aware, there's kind of no, I, I don't think anyone's kind of got bogged down in the metaphysics of ca causality per se, Humean theories of well, why not? causality. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, well, why not? Why not? Um, it's certainly not something I've yeah. thought much about. I thought more in terms about simply in terms of predicting um, the dynamics of sensory streams or perhaps more appropriately. I mean, when you think about it, the brain is not really predicting sensory input as such. It's predicting its own activity. Right. The brain is just predicting its own activity. And it's just that at the sensory surface, those that Path, those patterns of neural activity are influenced by sensory information but at each level in the in the neural hierarchy the brain is essentially trying to minimize errors in in it in predictions associated with patterns of neural activity so it's it's trying to predict itself and it's just the fact that the brain itself is embedded within this this wider environment um, yeah. Um, so the, th the third point was about the dishwasher. Um, I think most theorists would say that, so although you might say that you trust the dishwasher, that doesn't necessarily mean the dishwasher is trustworthy. Um, so we sometimes, so I've heard people say, well, I don't trust the COVID vaccine, which suggests that the, the COVID vaccine is something that could be trustworthy or untrustworthy. Um, I, I don't think that that's something many philosophers would agree with. They would say that that's a misuse of the term trust because the COVID vaccine is not trustworthy or untrustworthy as such, although there is certainly a, the use of the term trust in those situations perhaps has a resonance with the kinds of situations in which we do use the term trust. You have the same sort of, you know, the feelings of vulnerability that, you know, you want, that you might come to some sort of harm. Um, and so by courtesy of that resonance with similar situations, that, that is what is motivating your use of similar terminology. But from a strict philosophical sense, I think philosophers would have problems with the idea of inanimate objects as being either trustworthy or untrustworthy. I mean, I think, think if I may again, I think, I mean, look, this some some theorists particularly people who are interested in things like actor network theory or more materialist theories of agency people like lambris maleferis i mean they they are you know they say yeah i mean uh, even even fairly uh in agent if that's a word uh kind of objects can be actors in a sense that they 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 impose important constraints on you and i think with the for instance the covid virus if it does turn out that it doesn't um it doesn't uh sorry virus with the covid, COVID vaccine if it turns out it doesn't actually give us any protection then it would be an untrustworthy untru vaccine in in pretty standard ways so i mean it may be that the concept of trust is fairly flexible and can be used for human beings, non-human, inanimate objects and animate objects. It's probably, uh, I mean, honestly, I don't, this is the only bit I, I might disagree with you so far. Uh, at least one philosopher, 
but perhaps one hasn't thought about this stuff really hard. My, I think I think that you know the concept of trust could be used in these different arenas. At least I don't see why they are of type difference. It might be there's a very shallow kind of trust, which is to do with you know these very limited domains, and then for and then there's the kind of trust that you're I think you're principally uh, interested in, which is you know has these kind of more flexible relations. But anyway, I mean maybe that's just maybe yeah. I, I mean there. Are- so there is, um, I mean, there, there is a, there is a general issue here about kind of using the analysis of linguistic um, situations as a means of motivating philosophical analyses. Um, you know, yeah. I, I, I suspect yeah, yeah, yeah. Wittgenstein had plenty to say about that. Um, to what extent can should we use the the common terminology, the vernacular usage of certain terms as a means of motivating or constraining philosophical analyses. I think that, that that's one issue. There is another issue here, though, that I think is is perhaps even more germane to your interests, Rob, yeah. which is that I think our, our understanding of what trustworthiness is is changing over time. And so as the world changes, we are more inclined to to use trustworthiness in different contexts and that reflects a shift in the the actual semantics of the word trustworthiness so it's not that we are deliberately engineering trust the concept of trustworthiness it's more that there is a kind of natural evolution of the concept if you like and we're trying to kind of keep track of that so it's not the case i think that we could develop a philosophical analysis of trustworthiness that would then stand for the rest of time that it's quite possible that courtesy of the way in which we change our socio-technical environment that our concepts need to be continuously updated and upgraded they are they are kind of the conceptual apparatus with which we confront the world is also changing in, in alignment with the external apparatus that we are constructing as part of our ecological, ecologically oriented engineering efforts. Um, the, 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 the fourth point you mentioned was in regard to the banker. Actually, I had, so I hadn't thought of that about the, you know, this idea that, okay, so you can have a banker and, they are serving your worst enemy, but they might be equally trustworthy to both of them. It is a, so thank you for that. It is, it's certainly worth thinking about. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that there could well be cases when this relativity problem doesn't apply and you've just, you've just given one, but I think, that doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't a relativity type problem that doesn't emerge in certain situations. Um, so even if it was the case that we could surmount this issue with regard to um, uh, individual trusters, I think there's still a problem when it comes to the domain of interaction. So if your worst enemy trusted your bank to steal all your money and give it to them, then your bank is put in an awkward situation. It either has to be trustworthy relative to you or trustworthy relative to your worst enemy, but one or the other has to give way. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I think think that case, but I suspect at least there is a, um, I suspect there's a kind of class of, which is in the way that we think of trust, which is we trust people not to do things specially for us. We trust people not qua their relationship to us and our identity or our us as a person, but we trust them qua their particular role. And for instance, so I was this is the reason I gave the bank. I didn't give you the full case, but the, the reason is the bank. So it's well known that if a bank um, fails to be able to fulfill people's claim to get their money back you have a you have a you have a you have a run on the bank right everybody then tries to go and get some money out or if people suspect they might not be able to fill it so in that case i want them to respect my worst enemy's um uh claims right i want them to be able to give my worst enemy his money back because if it turns out they can't do that then they they won't they won't or they, they won't fulfill their contract with me so in that case actually 
I just want them to, I mean, I think it fits part of your model, actually. It fits your prediction case because I want them to be, to be predictable and to do exactly what they, what, what they say they should do. But I don't want them to, I don't want them to, I don't want them to make any special, um, do, do anything special for me or for my worst enemy or for anybody else. I just want them to do what they say they're going to do. That's all. Yep. That's, the, that's the restriction. So, I mean, I think that this could be accommodated within the free energy account because you're, so, so you're saying the bank has a given social role. You have certain yeah. expectations of it. Um, that might be the basis for your generative model, right? Of what the bank yeah. is going to do. And the bank has to live up to those expectations and fulfill them. Um, at the same time, if the situation changes and the bank, you know, is suddenly put in a situation where it, it has to violate your expectations, um, as long as it informs you, as long as it changes your expectations so that you're not put at a disadvantage or your interests aren't negatively effective, its trustworthiness wouldn't necessarily be undermined. Well, so, there is a, no, one more caveat then, but it, there would be limitations, right? Because if it said suddenly I can, we can give you your money back, but we can only do it in six months, right? That might, just telling me that it would have to, I might consider that that, that information is no good useless or you know it's they've tried to inform me but i mean i'm not quite sure how to frame it but i can see how merely communicating uh they're that they're gonna in some sense fail to meet my my requirements it's not gonna it's not really gonna work right it's still gonna have to respect something a bit deeper that they've made an under previous undertaking that they're yes because this is what they would always try and do right or you know or you can think of all kinds of social entities politicians political parties governments we're not going to do this but we're going to do this other thing yes well, thanks for telling me but that's not i mean so one might say that in that situation your free your prediction error is being elevated right because you did expect the bank to do a certain thing and now they're reneging on it and they're pro- trying to provide all kinds of exculpatory uh, reasons um but nevertheless that doesn't undermine the fact that you're free energy has been inflated your expectations are violated so i mean i it's probably worth saying that the free energy account is not it's not necessarily a way of guaranteeing trustworthiness it's more a way of trying to understand trustworthiness make sense of it and then perhaps use that as a guide for for policy making and engineering efforts um I mean, the, 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 the final issue you mentioned was about predictions and that you could have someone who's a lying, deceitful con artist and you expect them to stab you in the stab you between the shoulders the moment your back is turned. And you're absolutely right, because the moment your back is turned, then that's exactly what they do. So an, an entity could be predictable without necessarily being trustworthy. And I think that's true. Um, but... But one thing, and maybe I didn't emphasize this enough in the context of the talk, is that it's only in those situations in which trust is placed that this kind of account comes into into play. So if you did believe that someone was a a lying, deceitful uh, con artist, then you wouldn't place your trust in them. It's more that, so the free energy account is more an attempt to understand what happens when someone places their trust in someone. So if you were to trust the con artist, um, well, if you, if you believe that the con artist was untrustworthy, you wouldn't place your trust in them. So the free energy account wouldn't come into play. If you did, it would be pr- because even though they might have done some dodgy things in, in the past, you never them expected, you expected them to come through with, for you and the con artist in as much as they responded by thinking well you know rob has trusted me and i really ought to do what he expects me to do then he's fulfilling the trust that he's placed in you um and in that sense he's trustworthy if by contrast he says look rob you can't trust me the moment your back is turned i'm going to stab you in the back (laughs) then you he prevents he prevents you from placing his trust in him And in that sense, he hasn't betrayed you. So his trustworthiness is not necessarily impugned. 
because he hasn't really violated your expectations in a way that, that would lead to a sense of betrayal. Um, and, you know, perhaps you might even say that he's trustworthy because of that, because he's not going to let you down as such. You can't rely on him. Perhaps you can't rely on him for anything, but he's not going to betray you. He's honest about what he's going to do. So it's, so it's, it's, it's I mean, I've been thinking about how to characterize this. It's, it's, the free energy account is not, does not insist on reliability. It's more a form of contingent reliability. And, and the nice thing about it is it kind of highlights the active role that trustees play in shaping the expectations that trusters have with the specific aim of minimizing the possibility of expectation related errors uh, or of minimizing what I call social free energy. Okay, well, great then. I think with that, we're at four fifteen, so that's kind of um, the dead on the official stop time. So, thank you very much, Paul Smart, for you know very original theory and uh, interesting uh, um, plunge into the world of trust and the artifacts of the future, possibly. So, so great stuff. All right, I'm going to stop recording at that point.